Psychosocial Wednesdays. Welcome to this evening. We're having a presentation by Marion Dunley. It was my idea to bring Marion because um, I tend to be very, very much an intuitive type and a bit out of touch with the body. I'd seen various people give presentations on different aspects of body therapy, body analysis at the Jung Institute. But the remarkable thing about Marion for me was she could explain it so I understood it. That distinction that uh, we all know people uh, in different kinds of, uh, kinds of work that we do that can do a thing extremely well, but then the ability to also sort of uh, convey it to others is a completely different skill. So it was delightful to have to do such an enchanting sort of beautiful job of this. Um, Marianne Dunley is a Jungian analyst and a somatics practitioner, and she's been leading workshops integrating body and soul work. She's head of training at Body Soul Europe, which is part of the Marianne Woodman Foundation. She's trained as a Jungian analyst, as a psychoanalytic psychotherapist, as a psychothesis psychotherapist, and also uh, several kinds of supervision. Her book, Body Dreaming, which came out in 2019, uh, has been sort of praised everywhere. And one uh, was co-winner of the IAA, oh, sorry, IAJS Best Book for 2020. It also won, let me see, National Association for the Advancement of Psychoanalysis, the Gratitude Award for the best book, which I remember a lot of the online discussion was not only how wonderful it was that a good book had won these prizes, but that the good Jungian book had won this prize. So very pleased by it. So um, uh, Marion is going to give a presentation and she may work with us a little bit and then we'll have questions afterwards. So Marion, if you'd like to start. Thank you very much, Paul and Bernard for welcoming me. I'm delighted to be here. And um, before we start, I'm going to say that I'm going to be using slides. So uh, that's, um, yeah, that's kind of a new thing in a way for me with Zoom, I'm beginning to use that model. And um, I will, my plan is to sort of run through the slides and then we'll break for questions and answers and hopefully, and um, I may do a little exercise at that point. Um, I'm starting with an image that I use a lot in the book. So just let me open this for a moment. Um, just to make sure that's it. Um, just, I beg your pardon, now. I've just gone into something here. Uh, so I have to stop share for a minute and see what I have up here. Yeah. Here we come. So I'm beginning with Newgrange. This is an image that uh, is very close to me. It's a place in the Boyne Valley in the east coast of Ireland. And we say in the elbow of the Boyne River, which stands for the goddess Bow. In the elbow of the Boyne River, there are more megalithic sites than anywhere uh, clustered together in Europe. And this particular one is well known. It's reconstructed there 
in the last 40 years. Um, and it's particularly well known because of its alignment with the winter solstice. That's the big thing about New Grange. And for me, that's a very, very powerful metaphor, this metaphor of alignment. I feel particularly in the time of the pandemic where we are right now, we're feeling the lack of alignment. Um, the crisis that's happened, that's everywhere, whether it's a crisis of medicines or vaccines or travel or quarantine or separation, homelessness, unemployment, um, medical emergencies, whatever. There is a great sense of out of kilter. It's, we are out of kilter and out of alignment. And I feel that um, the book is particularly in alignment with that in, in its attempt to call us towards alignment of psyche and soma, body and soul, matter and spirit. And here we have the matter of stone, as you can see, and its opening is towards the east and on the rising sun of the 21st of December, the sun comes through the cairn. There's an aperture above the opening there that you can see. And this, um, this is the curbstone that forms the entrance point, beautifully carved with the spirals. And here you have the entrance with the sunrise coming right through the cairn and climbing up through the passageway like the woman's body and into the central cairn for about nine minutes at the center it holds. And the light comes in and penetrates and inside there's another stone with beautiful spiral on it and there are chambers that would again signify the female body with the ovarian um, tubes and um, I'm very struck by this place the magic of the stone itself the ancient stone the matter that's there in darkness for most of the year 360 days and for five days a couple leading up and a couple just after the sunrise solstice you have this darkness and then the matter is lit up by the light the light coming from the sun from energy outside us and somehow their wisdom in knowing about alignment and creating this architecture that brings something really very forcibly together we could say in alchemy it's like the great conjunctio of matter and spirit and in a way, I, my work is about matter and spirit. It's about finding ourselves connected, more connected to the body's wisdom and psyche and body working together to combine and dance together at this, what I call a still point, which isn't about a stillness, but about a dynamic um, interchange. Now, here we have that lovely spiral again, showing us the continuity of life, death, and rebirth. So Jung's, Marion Woodman, who is my great mentor and teacher. So Marion always quoted Jung and his passion for the body. She brought us to read the Zarathustra seminars as part of our training. And here we have one of Jung's quotes that I felt captures what I'm moving towards tonight. The separation of psychology from the basic assumptions of biology is purely artificial because the human psyche lives in indissoluble union with the body. So that's our premise, really. Now, I began by talking about the pandemic and the dysregulation that's there. And Lawrence Van, or Van der Kolk Bessel, who wrote the book, The Body Keeps the Score, he's talking here about under normal conditions, he says, people react to a threat with a temporary increase in their stress hormones. And as soon as the threat is over, the hormones dissipate and the body returns to normal. 
that's like I said earlier, there's a natural homeostasis, a natural capacity for regulation that's in our bodies. We are activated, we have a sympathetic nervous system that rises towards activity, engagement, and a parasympathetic, which is like the waves that comes back down on the beach again, it pulls out, it's a relaxation. One is very much about the heart and the lungs, and the other is about the digestion, the rest. The stress hormones of traumatized people, in contrast, take much longer to return to baseline and spike quickly and disproportionately in response to mildly stressful stimuli. Now, that sums me up at the moment. I don't know about the rest of you. I'm easily irritated. I think I'm absolutely fine. And then, whoo, I've gone to 100 for absolutely no, no reason, it would seem, not in my normal self. And I think we're all a little bit out of kilter. That's what I mean by that. If we can learn to reset the autonomic nervous system, we may find that our stressed and traumatized systems are able to realign with the inherent organic capacity for self-regulation. So Jung and as Jungians, we always learned about psyche as self-regulatory. That's why we tune into the unconscious, we tune into our dreams and to our images. But Jung is also saying, and it's right through the Zarathustra seminars, that the body is also self-regulatory. It's our organic capacity, our, our right, our inherent capacity for self-regulation that I am inviting us to be more conscious of by the end of this lecture tonight. But our body itself has the capacity to self-regulate. Now, Stephen Porges, many of you will be familiar with, and his concept of the vagus nerve. He was the one who really spent a lot of time breaking it down and seeing and how it's connected to stress. So the vagus nerve, vagus means the wanderer. It's the largest, it covers the largest amount of territory in the body. It hits every single organ. And there are two branches. There's the dorsal vagus and there is the ventral vagus. And the dorsal vagus in the, our evolutionary cycle is the oldest branch. And that's a bit like you play dead, the possum. When there's danger, everything goes into immobilization. We have written here, collapse or freeze in response to danger. So that is a system that's there in us all the time. It's not all the time operating because it's our least, it's the one that what we go to at the very end when everything else fails. We mostly go to when we're triggered or activated by something to the sympathetic system. This mobilizes the system into fight or flight. And that's our normal capacity for fight or flight. Everything is, the heart rate is up and the breath is ready for it and the oxygen is serving, ready for action. And we see this a lot in our responses again to the pandemic. Many people are running in terms of they're out there running or they're walking. But there's also a speed at which people are doing things. And there's also then a fight, you know, where we can see that a lot. There's a lot of fighting going on in many uh, multimedia areas at the moment. And then the ventral vagus, which links the muscles of the social engagement system with the muscles of the heart and respiratory system. And that's the kind of the most sophisticated of our systems because it's the one that responds very quickly to danger because we look, our eyes are white, we're open like this, like the, the doe in front of the, the deer in front of the car lights. Are we we're listening? Our hearing is very accentuated. Or we might scream. So all of this is the social engagement that we have available to us to respond. But it's also the availability to can bring calm to the system. So that system, we can look at somebody with eye contact and we can immediately convey something of calm to, their name, to them. The same with a smile. Um, the smile of the child that brings the smile to us. 
It's a natural capacity for self-regulation through these muscles of the face and the head and the neck. We turn towards somebody and we can count. That's okay. It's a soothing voice, settle and soothing with the ventral vagus. Un unfortunately, if the dorsal is in operation, which is the shutdown or collapse, we've switched off from the ventral vagus. So you can just see off of these really blank faces, which can happen to a lot of us from a day in Zoom, where we really are chilled out, but in the frozen sense, not in the relaxed sense. So uh, I think Porges is really, really important in understanding stress and what's going on. And each of us has really got to become cognizant of which is our default position. And when we're working with people, it's really important to know what our own default position is, where I'm coming from, and how I respond to stress, because that's going to be in the field between myself and the client. But also, I've got to be really observant of the person's capacity for stress. How are they responding? And what's the default position? Now, because of the plasticity of the brain, we can alter the, uh, our brain and the neural wiring and pathways that are set up right from our earliest connections with the mother in the womb. The wiring is set, but it's not, and it's encoded and serves us all the time, but we can change it. And so part of our work tonight is going to be really showing you how we can work with the nervous system to change it. And why would we change it? It's a very important question. Well, apart from just feeling a bit better or much, much better, it really expands our capacity for life. You know, in a lockdown, things can get narrower and smaller. But actually, if our nervous system is less uh, focused on survival, we have more energy. We have more energy for inquiry, for curiosity, for learning, for connection, for engagement. And we have a greater capacity then to be more aligned at a deep psycho and um, spiritual level. And that level for me connects me in consciousness to the planet, to everything around me. I can be more related to nature. Now, I think there is something happening with nature at the moment. So many people are resorting to walking and they're commenting on the quiet of the roads or the bird song or the spring dawn chorus. People are affected by the blossom that's happening in a new way. You know, I used to pass that tree all the time and I never saw it. And I've taken a photograph of it this morning. It's amazing. So something is already shifting in our time. In the fact that things have slowed down in a way, people's capacity for seeing is helping to join the dots that have been interrupted and that we are hopefully going to become a people more connected with each other and with every all life on our planet. So I want to go to the, the next one here. Um, yeah, so the role of regulation is so important that I now see attachment primarily as a theory of emotional and bodily regulation. Now, this is a bit of a jump, but I did mention earlier that the encoding and wiring for the nervous systems is, begins in the womb. It's actually transgenerational, so it's conveyed through the mother's body in the womb, the environment that is offered to the child, the sense of safety that is there for the infant to grow, and sure, when I read that, I was so excited because he seemed to be able to really show because neuroscience was, you know, coming in when Shore came and he did all his uh, really wonderful synthesizing of neuroscience and psychoanalysis and developmental theory. And he's able to say there that attachment theory is primarily emotional and bodily regulation. So... It's built into the nervous system in the course and as a result of the infant's experience with its mother. So it, again, attachment is related to security and to safety. And here we have, we just said the nervous system is always responding to what is safe. It's going to protect us with its defenses. 
if something is considered unsafe, then I'm going to make, I'm going to listen and make an alert and I'll try to calm myself. Oh no, it's okay. That was nothing. It was just a car going past. So I've calmed myself. Or else I get ready. Oh my God, there's a fire. I need to run, get out of here. Or there's the freeze where I see something and I can do absolutely nothing. I'm just gobsmacked is what we say in Ireland. So all of these experiences have their beginnings in the womb with the mother. And I like to use this phrase that body dreaming is builds a learned, secure attachment to the body. So we always think about attachment in relation to the other. And in fact, I'm trying to really say that it's about an attachment to oneself through connection with one's own body, coming home to one's body. If the mother doesn't take part in the rules of the mutual regulation, so the mother is easing and ooing and calming the baby, or else is playing with the baby and enlivening the baby. But if she's not in tune, if there isn't an attunement, it's very disturbing to the infant. And it's as though the infant's experience is, if I can't affect you, I don't exist. In adult life, we may find that the nervous system is still responding in response patterns that are formed in infancy. The energy that is blocked as a result of outmoded patterns of response forms or constellates as psychological complexes. So it's like the, the patterns that we've created, we've mentioned attachment patterns earlier, we're talking about nervous system responses that become default positions. They can be outmoded patterns of response. It's like the brain hasn't switched off. It hasn't got the message that it's now safe. And so energy gets blocked up in these places and they form psychological complexes. So it's a way of bridging the idea of a complex with our physiology. Very simply put, if I'm dealing with somebody who's coming into me and they're quite activated about something and they've had a dream and they want to tell me about the dream, very often I will be working to bring in great regulation, greater regulation to their system right at the beginning. I'll find some way, and we'll talk about this shortly, of regulating them so there is greater space and they're not caught in their default fight, flight, or even freeze position. And in doing so, there is more space and availability then for the emotion that the dream image brings in. And they may not be quite taken by it in the same way as they were as when they presented it first. It's like there's more emotional space around it. They're less triggered and less activated. That's what we're talking about why it's important to bring in the biology here, the body, to support the dream image, to see what is the dream bringing? What's this new piece that the dream is bringing in? Why is it telling us this story now? And in order to feel into what's new or what the lysis of the dream may be, we listen to where the body is too one-sided in a fight, flight, or freeze, where there's too much stress and hopefully bring greater, what we now call, coherence into the whole system. Now, I was very excited to come across Candice Pert's work. Um, for me, I didn't meet her until the 90s, but it's very, very powerful, really. And she got a Nobel Prize for her concept around emotions. She says, emotions are what link mind and body Every second, a massive information exchange is occurring in the body. Neuropeptides and their receptors, these were her discoveries, they're the substrata of emotions 
and they're in constant communication with the immune system. Again, very important when we're talking about our immune system in the middle of a pandemic, how to support it. So here we need, she says, the, these neuropeptides, which are carrying emotion throughout the body, they link the major systems of the body into one unit called the body-mind. Now, I don't think there's a therapist amongst us or even indeed an individual who hasn't heard somebody say, I'm either really anxious or depressed. It's like there are very polar positions at the moment around our response to the pandemic. And I love that she brings its body mind. It's neither one or the other, but both. Now, how to work with this? Um, I was delighted to see reading Demasio that Spinoza is, was already there, you know, in the 15th century. The power of affect is such that the only way we have to overcome a detrimental affect an irrational passion is by overcoming it with a stronger positive affect, one triggered by reason. You know, it's, this, is, this is mindfulness in the 15th century. Reason induced emotion and not by pure reason alone. So all the talking in the world is not going to overcome the power of that affect. It's got to be met with an emotion as big and as strong. And I always remember from the physics class, the only thing I remember is equal and opposite. And here we have reason-induced emotion. And we could ask ourselves, well, how do we bring in reason-induced emotion? It's where we bring our attention, where we put our attention. Now, this is Fechner, and he was around, before, he was one of Freud's lecturers. Freud loved to go to hear him speak. And um, there are great stories about Fechner. And one of the pieces that he was really, he focused on was the dynamic equilibrium. There, the, can you all see this? All right, am I blocked? Is the screen blocked or is it okay? Yes. So it's okay. Yeah, good. So for Fechner, pleasure comes with the re-establishment of a dynamic equilibrium. So when things are out of kilter, there is pleasure in an organic pleasure in having a dynamic equilibrium. There is joy to be had in knowing how to find balance. And this is really important because it's satisfying. And when the body is satisfied and the psyche and body are satisfied, it brings more equilibrium and a dynamic equilibrium. And it's the pleasure principle. Now, Freud took it in a different direction and we're not going to go there this evening. But Freud was very taken by Fechner's work on pleasure. And it's, he's pointing out that it's part of our, our nature, our human nature, to seek pleasure, to bring in greater dynamic equilibrium to our whole system. Now, how to do this? So I came across uh, Peter Levine's work uh, again in the 90s and Waking the Tiger was his book, his first seminal book on trauma. And he uses the word resource. It's a very simple word. And he says it's any positive memory, maybe of a person, an animal, a place, could be an action that creates a soothing feeling in your body. So you invite yourself here now just to consider what would be a resource for you? What could give you pleasure to think about? A place, a person, an animal, or a particular action? Maybe that you rub your hands or you stroke your eyebrows or you swing your feet. Where is the soothing coming in? And as you think about it, amplify it a little bit. Just see yourself there or with that person or in that experience. And then the next piece is to bring your attention to the physical response, 
the resonance that your body is having with that experience. So as you think about that place, how does it make you feel? And the next piece is notice the difference. This was also Fechner, just noticeable difference, he would say. That's all we need because that starts off and turns the wheel towards the dynamic equilibrium. Just noticeable difference. Wrote a great paper with Weber around that. So notice the difference when you consider this place or this person or this animal. Notice the difference. Is there a smile in your face or have you become a little bit less agitated or are you more comfortable in your chair or has it animated you? You may have been a bit sleepy and now you're getting excited about something. The just noticeable difference is what brings in and moves us towards greater dynamic equilibrium. And then this other resource that I use is called The Felt Sense from Eugene Gendlin. And a uh, felt sense is not a mental experience of something, but a physical one. Physical, a bodily awareness of the situation or person or event. It's a little bit with what I just did just now when I asked you to think about a person or a place that you liked and would bring pleasure. And then I said to you, now go to your body and see the just noticeable difference, what's happened in your body as a result. That's called the felt sense experience. And it's, a, it's like one of our senses that has become quite dormant. And in working with the body, we're awakening that sense. It's a wonderful way of attuning to ourselves. And it brings dimension and groundedness to our experience. It's one of the means by which we build secure attachment to the body by paying attention to the felt sense of the experience. And then we have the experience of orienting. And this is an exercise. And again, just inviting you to do it quickly. The eyes want to go someplace. You may not want them to go there, but they go there. So you invite the client or yourself Go let your eyes take you for a wander around the room. And before you know it, they've kind of paused somewhere or they've blinked at something. And just go back and see what, what caught their attention there. And spend a little bit of time being curious about what it is that's drawn your attention to that. And in itself, then you pay attention to the felt sense of the experience and the just noticeable difference. And in working in that particular way, something is happening. One can no longer be consumed with anxiety and trauma because all your attention is taken there. And it's the right hemisphere exploration. And the right hemisphere is always open to the new. It's available for curiosity and exploration. It's also a, a, available for amplification. And so that kind of a conversation about something that the eyes are drawn to is, has potential to be endless. You need never worry with your client that you're going to run out of things to say because you're in the right hemisphere and it can go on and on and on. It's the field of amplification. Us Jungians love that. So one of the texts that boasts so much about the body from Jung is his seminars in Zarathustra where he says, Zarathustra says to go to the body, go into the body, and then everything will be right. For there, the greatest intelligence is hidden. As you know, Marion Woodman, when she was training in Zurich, she worked with her body and she worked with her images. But she couldn't tell her analysts at the time where she would have been thrown out. It wasn't acceptable to work with the body. We're here to work with the unconscious and that's the psyche. But Marion went home and spent two hours or three hours in the afternoon with the tape recorder and she would tape the just noticeable differences, what was going through her mind, what were the thoughts, what were the emotions. 
and you would work the image in the body. If you want to live your own life, your images and your body are your individual guides. Together, they strengthen your inner core. And again, here referencing the inner core, that's for me is the secure base in the body. So the images from the psyche and your body are your guides. Jung, this is one of his ones that we love. The self has its roots in the body. Indeed, in the body's chemical elements. That's the nervous system. It's what all the cortisol that's pumped, stress hormones that are pumped, etc. When we bring images from our dreams, movement, visualizations, drawing, and other forms of creative expression to consciousness in our bodies, we can experience the transformative power of the body. The purpose is to live in the cells of the body. Now, this is really beautiful for Marion because central to her work is eros. It's not about power, our body over mind, or mind over body. It's eros. The purpose is to live in the cells of the body so that we can hear what the cells are saying. There is a wisdom in the body, but if we don't bring that wisdom to consciousness, it cannot be transformative. So we listen in the way the mother and the infant work. The mother listens to the, the infant and the infant responds. The body needs to know we're responding to it. We're hearing it. We're absolutely paying attention. Just as the dream world needs to know we're receiving the dream, the body needs to know we're present and there for it. That's about consciousness. And that's where the transformation happens, bringing consciousness to it. Once we're in connection with the love coming through our own cells, then we can feel the suffering in the cells of the trees, in other people, in the planet. We recognize oneness, then we simply cannot violate the earth. That's the that importance nowadays, I feel, of oneness. When we think about New Grange, their feeling of alignment with something outside and right at the core of our matter. And here on, for the survival of our planet and ourselves as a species, are in the importance of recognizing our oneness through consciousness of our own selves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marion. Thank you, Paul. I think you can, let me see, end the sharing. Mm -hmm. I'll do that. Thank you. I'm going to, well, uh, my question is embedded in my first meeting with you, um, <laughs> that workshop in Zurich. Uh, you worked with me and several other people, and it absolutely, um, I was giving a presentation on my thesis after that six-hour workshop. It was substantial enough that we could really spend time with you, and it was, uh, well, it was huge for me. Um, and I knew that I was writing about AIDS, because I always do. And... Um, by the end of that, I was thinking body, liveness, and I ended up writing about the passionate body, the body that wants to live, which I had not thought of in 30 years of being embedded in the world of AIDS. So for me, there's a big polarity between deadness, lifelessness, and liveness. And then in another direction is the kind of anxiety, uh, disorienting, uh, the slightly frantic quality that you're speaking of in relation to the pandemic. I'm tending to see those as different, but I guess I'm wondering, is that an illusory distinction or is that, is there any difference in those things? Would you see them as different arenas of the way we work or are they sort of mapped onto each other in some ways? Well, if I go back to Porges, it's the vagus nerve and it, it truncates right there at the base of the, the, um, the cranium. 
and the dorsal vagus is the one that goes down to freeze. That's right down in the lower, like in the intestines, down in the baulahula, I think Jung refers to it within the Zarathustra seminars. It's right down there. And that's the, you know, from phylogenetically, that's the first one that came on line for us as human beings mm -hmm. to deal with something that is absolutely overwhelming. And the other then, as I said, is the, are the, is the more the sympathetic, which is the heart rate going quicker. And the other is then the facial uh, social engagement system that can calm things down. So they're kind, they kind of go one, two, three in terms of what, but where people reside is really what we're curious about. Oh, okay. And one of the things that I discovered when I was studying all of this was that very often people present with a sympathetic, very overactive, hyper vigilant, hyperactive people. And underneath it, there's been a very early freeze. So it's like a compensation. And uh, when you work with that, that's, a, you know, there's a very deep depression. And I think with the pandemic, many people have fallen into depression who would never have considered themselves depressed before because they were running on the sympathetic. Mm. But they kind of the battery ran dry somewhere during this last lockdown. I think particularly since Christmas, people have really been feeling very low. Particularly because of human contact or, um, or is I'm, that just one way that it would, maybe I'm thinking of a rather extrovert one of my patients. Yeah, great. And what do you notice there, the lockdown? Um, well, he's been doing some very crazy things. Uh, some very self-destructive things. Yeah. And he was actually sent to me by a friend. I've been seeing him for free. And I did something that is probably not very psychoanalytic. I asked him to stop um, <laughs> going online and looking for people that he didn't know to engage in peculiar sexual practices where he would get hurt. Mm -hmm. So it was extreme. And I said, please stop this if we're going to talk. And he did for a month. Mm -hmm. And the simple, I realize this is way too simplistic, but the simple sort of parental instruction, stop doing this, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was a big help. A very lively, very energetic guy who has been engaging in some very weirdly destructive mm -hmm. behaviors. Mm -hmm. I'm going back to that slide of, you know, Tronics that says, you know, if, um, if I don't affect you, I don't exist. Mm. And somehow your connection with him and you're making a demand in yes. some ways. To him, that would, could translate that he affected you and he mm -hmm. doesn't exist. So his system could calm down and didn't you know, was able for that time to be more moderate when he was working with you at that time. It seems that it looks at me as some kind of steadying. Well, you can, you can see all this, but it's, it's, it's been a slightly unusual relationship, which is interesting. Yeah, it's really, it's interesting for me when I was doing a lot of this, how I really felt the early developmental piece, the attachment work, and the relationship, the first relationship, really creates those responses in the nervous system and that we're always dealing with it. It's like a tap root for me. It goes right down to that early response and that early wiring. And I may be dealing with something up here, but your response to him somehow connected him with something that was able to hold him and contain him in that early place. Uh, I don't know if this isn't too much to do it. The other aspect of his life is his mother is actually bipolar, cyclothymic. Mm -hmm. So the unpredictability of her, I think, is in the, womb. the fact that I'm not budging. Yeah, and particularly that like in the womb. Yes. You know, and what was the flooding of the chemicals? Must have been. In the womb. Hadn't thought of that. As Thank a you. Yeah. Uh, here's a question from Sarah McNerland Barak. Uh, 
everyone, you're welcome to put questions into the chat and, uh, and I'll read them for Marianne. Are there different parts of the body slash system that you tend to focus on if the presenting problem is depression versus anxiety? Um, that's good. Yeah, that's a good question. I'm thinking, um, is, am I focusing on a body system? So I'm reading definitely what the default position is, how the response is, how quickly it comes in. And just like I said, some people are very, very hyper active or hypervigilant, and then there may be an underlying depression. But often at the moment, people are coming in feeling pretty depressed. And then I, I, may, I may just listen because it's become a default as well. So it, it's, it's become the, the tune that they're playing. And I'm, I'm just listening to it. And I'm, so I may be interested in if they've had any dreams so for instance, I met somebody recently on Zoom and uh, somebody I've worked with for a very long time, I have had a huge long break of years and years and we're back working again. And this person said, my God, I have been so depressed. And then she said, you know, I'm grateful for the depression this time and for the pandemic because I've had time to go into it. And when we started to work with the dreams, they were just so, so powerful. We were back into some very negative archetypal um, figures. But at the same time, she now had so much more capacity and presence to be with them. Just like she was more present to her depression, she could also be more present to what this archetypal energy was. And over the course of a very short few weeks, things changed radically for her. And I would say it was about the spaciousness around it. Mm. We're not trying to shift depression. We're just trying to acknowledge it and be with it and see what else is there. So it's not that that's bigger than that. It's like, that's the symptom. Okay. And we're waiting now for the body and the psyche to self-regulate because it will self-regulate if you give it the space. That's what happens. Mm. Either through the dreams or in the physiology while we're working, there might be an impulse or a movement that wants to come or a gesture that I notice is being repeated that I may just bring attention to and see what's in that gesture. You're laughing, Sarah. No, oh, Sarah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> yes, she is. Thumbs want to up. say something? No. I can unmute people if you'd like. Um, we, we don't always, but I know that uh, Marion was also willing to uh, to directly communicate with some people. So tell me if you'd like me to. Um, Karen Chan, a related question. How has working with the bodies of your clients over Zoom been for you? Can you please discuss possible strategies to overcome the challenges? Mm -hmm. There's a hard one. Well, I was working with Zoom for a very long time because um, I went to Zurich to write my book and I had my clients on Zoom all through that time. And that's really a very long time ago now, at least I'd say, yeah, 2011, I think I went. So um, I, felt, I feel that if I didn't have the body work, I would be completely dissociated, I would say at this point. But the fact that I always take my base note as what's happening in the system of the person in front of me. You know, what's the system? What is the body psyche happening, doing? How are these images relating in the body? How is the body presenting today? What's, I don't go and measure the pulse rate, but I'm absolutely witnessing where the nervous system is at today. And what's the one-sided position? Because that's what we're listening for in the psyche, but we're also listening for that in the body. And that really, for me, brings me into a very dynamic relationship, both with myself and the person. I find that if I wasn't using this, I would be much more tired than I am. Mm. Yeah. Do you use, you'll pardon me, just do you use other senses? I always remember Verena Cost at one point 
when we had to start using Zoom, she said she couldn't stand the fact that she couldn't smell the client. Oh, that's great. No, I'm not that, I'm not a sensei type. No, I, I, I don't, I don't feel that. I think I, I do, I definitely miss the body. Like mm. there's no doubt about it. I miss, I really miss the body. And I love seeing a body express itself and how it expresses itself. So I'm just reading that. And I try to get as much like, you know, your camera now, Paul, right? There's at least a foot above your head that's empty space. Mm -hmm. So if you were my client, I would have it down so that the top would be just above the head there. And I'd see more of the body because I have to try and see the body and what are the natural responses because the cues are in the body and often the cues for healing are in the body. I mean, um, Levine says unresolved trauma is often an, something, a gesture, a movement that was interrupted. So for instance, if somebody had a really bad crash, they may have wanted to do something like that to stop mm -hmm. the approaching vehicle. That movement needs to happen in order for them to be released because otherwise they're going to it can become defensive. That I think everything in life I have to do that for mm, is yes. actually the gesture is that, and I've got to find you know, so I'm reading bodies all the time. This is uh Dennis Merritt. It seems the way that you described the rational changing is related to the spirit animal concept where the animal comes from a sacred sense of the animal in a dream or as received in a vision quest. That animal is then meant to be an influence or medicine in one's life. One consciously goes to the animal when stressed or disturbed. So I think this is a comment that, you, you know, the beginning of that was the, the way you described the rational changing is related to the spirit animal concept. Does that yeah, when we're, we're bringing mindfulness, we would say, or, you know, the reason-induced emotion. Mm -hmm. So we think we invite our attention to go towards something that brings us pleasure. Uh, just in the same way, we invite our attention, be it eye or ear or, or smell, it could be to orient outward and to see what is engaged. And as it becomes engaged with something on the outside, uh, when I was writing or researching, I came across a quote of Jung's that um, Joan Chodoro used when she uses the word betrachten. Betrachten is to notice something, but it's also something that's impregnated with life when I give it attention. So when I orient towards an image, I'm giving it attention and likewise, reveals something of itself to me. So there's an engagement and an enlivening and expansion of the conversation that I talked about earlier when one in, is in that reason-induced emotion exercises. This is uh, Christina Frasher. I'm curious about the connection to physical illness, which of course overlaps with such a lot of what you're presenting as the frame today. If we look at the body as providing wisdom, would an inability to express that, for example, if one has not expressed this in body's work, body work, then lead to illness? Okay, so if, pardon me, I'm probably mis, misreading this. Um, if so, is there wisdom in the physical illness? I suppose, in other words, if there's a problem that's getting expressed in illness, is there wisdom in the physical illness? Um, I would love to ask that of the person themselves what they think about that. You know? mm. um, I think each person's body is speaking to them. It's the particular body where the soul lives and the soul is in communication with the particular body. So, um, yeah. I think that's a very ancient belief, really. Mm. And ancient medicine, whether it's Chiron or Hippocrates, 
there's that belief that our illness can speak to us like the mm. symptom or the image or the dream. So if, hmm, if one of the experiences you were looking at was the entire experience of Zoom fatigue mm -hmm. or, you know, the detachment of it, mm -hmm. um, Hmm. Well, how would that change the frame of everything we're doing? I suppose you've already spoken to that. But is there a way that, uh, as opposed to merely the hope of ending the particular portion of history that we're in, is there a way we can be with this that would be more helpful for ourselves? That's a fairly incoherent way of asking. I hope it's clear. Um, well, I hope that I've been able to, I mean, it's a very short time, just 30 minutes. And as you said, I haven't had time to work with people individually, but um, really presence to the body is vital, vital and um, matter and psyche, two aspects of one and the same thing. And when we really pay attention to the body, and I just mean listening to the nervous system and helping the nervous system to settle, then you have so you have an immediate expansion. How many people here, when I asked you to think of something pleasurable, felt your shoulders drop or your breath just deepen a little bit, or even notice that you took a breath at that point? We be just we have more space and more fluidity. We're less rigid, less one-sided. We're more capable of meeting so many situations by being present to a, to a system that's more regulated. And if my system is more regulated, then I am, am impacting everything around me in the field. And that helps our whole world. Thank you. Um, lovely work, Marianne. Thank you so much for your book. Thank you so much for presenting here. Um, I do want to tell everyone, it's not really a reminder as we haven't announced it yet. In two weeks, we will have another book launch. This will be for The Plural Turn, which is a book uh, edited by our own Stefano Carpani. He's making another presentation tonight, so he can't be here. And it is on the work of Andrew Samuels. So we will advertise that and arrange that within a couple of days. I need to get onto that because it's soon. And then in a month, we'll have Renos Papadopoulos as a guest. So thank you all so much for coming. Is there anything else you'd like to say, Marian? Or Thank you. It's a great honor to be here with you and among such guests. And uh, thanks to everybody for your attention. Thank, Thank you so you. much for your work. Thank, Thank you, you yeah. everyone. Uh, take care, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thank you, Marion. Thank, Thank you. Bye.